We own 20 large dams across New South Wales. We have about 300 people spread across 43 offices. We look after 7,000 kilometres of rivers and we have also about 240,000 hectares of land. 140,000 hectares of that land is normally actually underwater when the dams are actually full. Wouldn't be a presentation if I didn't actually throw in a picture of a dam. This is our Hume Dam, which is down on the uh, Victorian New South Wales border. One of the interesting things about um, the Murray River, which you folks might hear lots and lots of debate about when you occasionally see Australian press, is most rivers around the world um, that form natural borders. Um, the actual borderline is usually right down the middle of the river. Um, the border on the um, the Murray River is actually on the Victorian side and is about uh, one length inside because it got determined in the 1800s by a court case because somebody on the New South Wales side of the river shot somebody on the Victorian side of the river and there was a high court case to challenge as to which court should actually hear the, um, the case. So the border is on the Victorian side. That doesn't stop the Victorians though wanting their half share of what's actually in the river. Um, state water is a, um, a, I guess, a legacy business. We've been in the business in various different iterations for more than 100 years. We have uh, multiple customer touch points. We have lots and lots of legacy information systems and a large number of disparate information systems. We also have little control over the initial transaction. And what I mean by that is to um, extract water from one of our rivers, you need to have a license and you can go and get the license in two ways. You can either go and apply to the government for a license, and most of the market's are already constrained, so there is no more water available for licensing, or you can go and purchase a license. That transaction is governed by the New South Wales Office of Water, and it's that information that goes into their system that comes across to our system to say which account to set up. So one of the interesting challenges we have in our business right now is the account goes in, if you can imagine, I go and buy a license in the name of David Anderson, and I go and buy another license in the name of D Anderson, and the information gets transferred across to us, and we don't actually know that they are two separate customers. We also have a very complex regulation and um, regulatory systems. We, um, we are regulated, I, I was gonna put up a map with the number of regulators and regulators, so I've decided to leave it out, but um, it looks like a um, sunflower diagram of all the various different regulators that have a part on us and starting next year we will actually have two pricing regulators, not one pricing regulator. You've heard about the Murray-Darling Basin, so under the New South Wales, sorry, the Commonwealth Water Act in 2007, the Murray-Darling Basin or the federal government took control of water in the Murray-Darling Basin. So as of next year they will take over pricing within the Murray-Darling Basin but our area of operation is inside the basin and outside the basin, so we will have to answer to the New South Wales pricing regulator for some of the water and the federal pricing regulator for some of the other water. I thought I'd um, try to describe our information systems, but I thought I found this picture and it seemed much more adept. It's um, somewhat better than probably some of our information systems in that at least a number of these actually have quite discrete connections. A number of our information systems right now do not have discrete connections. And for that, I thought I'd just look at our billing environment, just the billing environment inside our business. As I said, the license administration is actually controlled by a separate government agency. It's not controlled by us. Separate to that, um, the water title. So when you buy a license, it's a mortgageable instrument. So it's like a, um, owning a um, owning a piece of land or a house or something like that, so you actually have a title or a deed to the license for water that you can have, and it's a mortgageable instrument, so the water title is actually held by a separate government department, and the connection between these two, I sometimes joke, is sneaker net. Um, sometimes the person gets on a train wearing sneakers and goes to somebody else, and then actually transfers the CD ROM um, once a week. So. The communication uh, from here to here is by sneaker net. The other way back, it's um, actually daily XML. So it's kind of interesting uh, even how some different government organisations how in terms of their communication. We have a water account 
system, so every single time you want water out of our river systems, you have to order the water. And you might say, why does a customer have to order water to take water out of a river system? A river system, if you like, is a, uh, it's, it's a constrained system. It is a little bit like a pipeline. So our customers need to order water so that we know to release water at a particular time to travel down the river system because we know the customer is going to be extracting water at that particular time. If we don't release water to travel down to where the customer is going to extract the river, they can actually um, do, they can run the river dry. In the case of one of our customers out in western New South Wales, their pumping capacity is so sufficient that when they get going, if there's not enough water in the river, they can actually drive the river in the other direction. So um, we need our customers to order water to make sure there's sufficient water in the system. We also have a whole lot of meter readers who go out in the field to actually read the meters of what customers have extracted. That comes across, or as I've noted here, some triggered events, comes across to our billing database. Our billing database then notifies the information across to our account database on a monthly basis as to what customers have paid and what customers haven't paid and how much we've got out there. We have a customer help desk where we take transactions from customers who are calling in to query bills, never mind some of the channels that we're dealing with. So this is just the billing environment inside our business currently, so clearly we need to do something different. <laughs> the solution probably looks a lot more complicated than the picture I had up on the board just a moment ago, but this solution is for our entire business, not just for the building environment. But the key thing that I probably want you to notice um, is these four blocks in the middle. All the rest of it is just talking about um, our communications pathway, a common portal across our business. But essentially we've embarked this year on a, um, a project to overhaul our entire financial asset based systems and replace it with an organisational wide ERP system. Our plan at the end of that is that our customers, or our, sorry, our employees across the business will have one information system to go into, not multiple information systems to go in. Today, we require our customers, our employees, sorry, to do time accounting because they're working on various different valleys and we need to code their work to the various different valleys to make sure the cost goes there. But today, we require them to code it into the timekeeping system for payroll. We require them to code it into the maintenance system so that we can work out what's going on. And then somehow we try to marry the two pieces of information to go into our finance system for job costing basis. So that's changing. We have another project underway right now to replace our water accounting system. And these two programs are well underway right now, which relate to water delivery. I'm happy to talk to folks afterwards about the computer aided river manager. It is probably going to be a world um, leading system when we finish deploying that in the next couple of years. Now I thought I'd talk um, a, a little bit about 360 and try and get a full view of customers. And one of the places that I thought I might start with, I don't know if anybody has seen Gartner's Magic Quadrant talking about organisations who have, you know, a, a complete vision or have a complete ability to execute and where people might land inside that, um, that descriptor. I guess um, I think it's reasonable to say that a large number of utility companies successfully focus on a small segment um, and don't necessarily out innovate other customers. Uh, the reason I want you to uh, look at that is it'll make more sense as we go through. Measuring from the right perspective, we'll come back to um, the um, Gartner's Magic Quadrant. One of the things um, a lot of businesses make a common mistake about is they look at customer metrics or measurement metrics from within their own business. They're very their centric, they're not customer centric. And I wanted to talk about it particularly in two um, great examples I can talk about. When I was over at Federal Express, I remember a, um, a gentleman at the time um, Tom Oliver, who was our Senior Vice President of International, asked a question one day. He wanted to know if we were doing a better job for our customers. Seemed like a reasonable enough question. And somebody top, um, stepped up and said, you know, Tom, of course we're doing a better job for our customers. Um, we're doing 99% service level now. 99% of our packages we pick up and deliver are being delivered on time. 
So I'm sitting back and gets out his little notepad and says, look, let me get this right. Two years ago, we were delivering 10,000 packages a day. And we delivered a 90% service level. You know, by my calculations, we we're annoying 1,000 customers a day, or 2,000 if you count both the person who's shipping the package and the person who's receiving the package. Today, we're doing a 99% service level, but we're shipping in excess of a million packages a day. So we're annoying 10,000 customers a day, 20,000 if you count shipper and receiver. So are you telling me that annoying 20,000 customers today is doing a better job than annoying 2,000? customers today. So everybody had to go back and rethink about how we might look at um, what was important to the customers out there. So one of the things the organization did was go back and look at what are all our customers have been complaining about. What was important back then was Federal Express believed that on-time delivery of packages were important. Well, it turns out that a whole number of other things were just as important to our customers. One of the things was billing. You know, so we started measuring the number of invoice adjustments. And not the percentage of invoice adjustments, but the absolute number of invoice adjustments. How many invoice adjustments did we make? We then started measuring abandoned telephone calls. A telephone service centre, its service level is only as relevant to the customer as it takes for a customer to be answered. If a customer hangs up, then a customer is probably not being answered as fast as the customer might. Now you have to take some numbers out of that, and, and what I mean by that is if the customer hangs up in less than 10 seconds, there's a good chance that the customer probably didn't mean to dial your organisation in the first place. But it's starting to look at customer metrics from the customer perspective. One of the things Federal Express has been very successful at doing is measuring in absolute numbers the total number of failures and driving down the total number of failures whilst driving the volume up. So not only percentage-wise have they been getting better, but in terms of absolute times they fall down in front of the customer, they do as well. The NRNA example um, is probably a, a different kind of example and talks about setting um, and managing customer expectations. The NRMA in Australia is a um, road service organisation. It's also an insurance company, but um, um, a road service organisation in terms of if you break down and you want somebody to come and um, help you on the side of the road, um, it's a state-based organisation, has about new, 2 million customers in New South Wales. One of its, um, um, I was about to say sister organisations, but a, a brother organisation, if you like, is RACV, the Royal Automobile Club of Victoria, who's down in Victoria. They implemented a new dispatch system for their customers, and one of the things that we all used to say was when a customer broke down on the side of the road, the customer would call up and say, excuse me, I've broken down, can you come help me out? And the standard expectation we would give the customer was, thank you for letting us know, we will be out there in under 60 minutes to come and start your car again. I can tell you on the average number of cases we got there in under 40 minutes, but the customer expectation was whenever we got there in quicker than 60 minutes, that we actually delivered good service. The RACV implemented a new system and they were able to predict when the patrolman would get there. So when the customer called up, they'd say, um, thanks for calling, we'd like, to, um, we'd like a patrolman, well certainly, um, we'll have a patrolman there in 25 minutes time. Then when the customer called back six months later because they'd broken down, and the RACV told them this time it would take 55 minutes, the person would start to get into an argument on the telephone with them saying, no, 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 it took 25 minutes last time. I want the 25 minute service this time. So I think it's also important to understand things from a customer aspect, from a customer perspective, but it's also important to set the right expectations. If you're going to deliver a service of 25 minutes and make that commitment to the market, then you want to make sure that you're going to continue to deliver that service at the level of 25 minutes. If that's not what you're going to deliver, then you might think about how you might communicate it differently. Um, Gartner talks about you know, typical organisations have lots and lots and lots of customer information across um, their organisation. I'm going to challenge that right now and say that most organisations out there don't have lots of customer information. They have one step back, they have a lot of customer data. They don't even know that often the information is about their customers and it's, a, it's in a whole lot of disparate systems that don't talk to each other. I, this, this diagram probably encapsulates it quite well. As I said, 
There's a whole lot of organisations that have a lot of data about their customers out there. Some of it's broken, but nonetheless, they want to know, um, in terms of driving your business, doing things right in the future, you probably want to turn that data into information. Probably means connecting it, probably means uh, finding out what that information is about, who it relates to, is it time bound? Then all of a sudden, we start turning this information into knowledge so that we can start making decisions about our customers. It's only that when we've gone through this pathway that we actually start driving change in our information systems out there. So, one of the challenges that I would leave you folks with today is to make sure that when you go back, before you add yet another information system out there, you look at how you're actually going to connect that data in your system. This is another view of it from a different perspective, but essentially, if you want to be driving and predicting the future behaviour of your customers, then you want to make sure that you're getting beyond this data paradigm. Um, I thought I'd just finish with a, a, a cartoon, you know. Uh, once upon a time, especially in that regulated um, business where you had no competition, it was probably good to drive your business on cut field because there wasn't anybody to contradict you. Um, I guess I'm in a competitive marketplace that uh, maybe that cut field is indigestion. Um, so now I'm, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions. Um, now that I've told you a little bit about the water business, which is completely different to what you're doing in your countries, um, and especially at a bulk level, not at a retail level. And everybody's just looking at me with a gobsmacked look on their face. Yes, sir. If you compare the customer interaction, the number of customer interactions a month to something like parcel delivery company, but how can you? I mean, how many interactions a month or a week or a day do you have with customers? Look, that's a good question. And I guess the point I was, um, um, Contrasting it to a parcel delivery company wasn't necessary to contrast how many interactions we were having, but just the value that it's customers amazing. put, you know, but the value customers put on an interaction in terms of there is nothing worse, I, I think, than sending a message to a customer than today, right now, um, the meters for our customers um, are owned by our customers, but we're rolling out and embarking on a $250 million program across New South Wales to replace all of those meters with meters that are owned by us. Now, um, I don't want to pick on Sam, we'll pick on Sally who's sitting next to him, but if Sally has just been disconnected by us because she hasn't paid her bills, and in fact we've gone to the next step of actually suspending her license, which means she can't even trade on her license, the last thing I want is somebody knocking on her door to say, we're here to um, install a government owned meter because these two information systems aren't actually talking. To each other. So, so I think FedEx or um, other organisations are good organisations that we can go and look at just in terms of how do they look at how customers look at things. You know, for a company, for our business, you might say that you're a monopoly right now. You don't need to um, um, look after your customers. You know, your customer has no choice. They have to come and use you. Well, that might be the case, but I can also tell you that 75% of our customers are agricultural. Um, they're extremely powerful in influencing the government. If we don't supply the level of service that they think is appropriate, then they'll be very good at influencing the government to open the market up to contestability or to find somebody else who might replace them. us out there. And yes. One more thing. Um, with relation to electricity, are you involved in any hydro energy? Good, good, good question. Um, a couple of answers to that. Um, we, we own 20 dams, so on about 12 of those dams right now, we've gone, and originally, we've gone to the marketplace and actually sourced market participants to put hydro generation on those dams. And the deals that we have struck, most of them have been long-term deals, but the deals we've struck with them is they pay us a lease fee for sitting on the dam wall, if you like, and they also give us a a percentage of the total revenue they make. Um, well, it, it's a nice deal, but um, but it's also um, it also gives us an incentive to go and find ways to help them maximise their revenue as well. So our computer-aided river pack, um, manager that I just alluded to and said, you know, feel free to come and ask questions about. 
one of the things it's going to do is um, substantially um, increase optimization of river operations and computerized river operations. But one of the things we're also doing is working how we might um, uh, maximize hydroelectric generation windows or shape the water release over a 24-hour period, bearing in mind a whole lot of other constraints like bank slumping and a whole lot of other environmental factors that we need to deal with. But what can we do to move more water into peak generation times so that we can get a better cut of the power? Now, um, we're, we're going to stick our toe in the water shortly, but on one of our dam sites, we're, um, which doesn't have a hydro generation, we're looking at putting in our own hydro generation. Um, it's only a relatively small site, and one of the reasons we're looking at doing that is probably to better inform us of what does and doesn't happen in the marketplace, so when we're negotiating with all the other dam hydro operators, then we're a much more informed market participant. We've had drought in Australia for about 10 years. You know, um, um, farmers don't necessarily want to pay a water bill, and it's usually the last bill that they want to pay. There are probably more pressing bills for them in terms of um, if they don't pay the seed merchant, you know, a crop. But um, one of the things that we're very lucky of having in New South Wales is um, our debt is the, um, the last right on the actual license. So if the customer chooses to sell his license in the future, when the, um, um, the government agency who transacts that transaction, they have to collect any money that is owing to us at the time that they transact the transaction. So I guess we, we do have the ultimate, um, 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 if you like, carve out. But having said that, um, we also have some unique political challenges as well. You know, um, we have a conservative government in New South Wales now, which is a coalition between uh, the Liberal Party and the National Party. The National Party predominantly represent um, the agricultural sector, so um, our customers are quite strong lobby groups and um, they're quite strong at convincing the minister that um, their charges should be waived. Um, so sometimes we have to deal with other kinds of pressure. So we might have to write to get it, but we also have to do some political legwork to make sure that um, the bill is actually paid. So who pays for the review of the government pays or the company pays? Well, um, um, in New South Wales, it might be different elsewhere, but in New South Wales, um, under the State Owned Corporations Act, um, we have what's called a shareholder minister and we have a portfolio minister. The shareholder minister is the treasurer and the portfolio minister is the minister for water. Under the Act, the, the minister, um, the portfolio minister is welcome to direct us how she wants, but if it costs us any money or makes us forego any money, um, she needs to come prepared with her checkbook. So if she wants to waive customer charges out there, because I can tell that usually the treasurer doesn't want to waive customer charges, usually the treasurer wants to do the opposite. He probably usually wants to ignore the pricing regulator and charge the customers even more. So if, if she wants to waive charges, she needs to go to cabinet and she needs to find the money somewhere else. So she has done that in the past. Um, we make sure that when she does do it, that we actually print on the bill that we don't make the bill disappear, we still send the bill out to the customer, letting them know that their water charges would have been X, and that they received the government waiver for Y, and that's why they owe Z, so that they're reminded that they still have this bill, and they're going to be paying this bill again at some stage in the future. Alrighty, um, I'm getting the wind-up call, and I'm the chair, you know. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to um, now take the, um, the opportunity to introduce us to our next speaker. Um, he's going to talk about efficient cash flow management for business sustainability and profitability. Um, Dr. Pawan Singh is a director of PTC India Financial Services. Um, Dr. Singh has had 25 years experience in financing, including infrastructure finance. In this time, Dr. Singh has handled several financing proposals both from the perspective of borrowers and lenders. Dr. Singh has also been closely involved with the first public-private partnership project in the power sector. He's currently a visiting faculty member in the area of corporate financing, infrastructure financing, and project financing at several management institutes in India. Dr. Singh is a member of the Indian Civil Services and has a PhD in financial management. So he's probably the first person here who's going to talk in much more detail in terms of dollars this afternoon.
this is how you know uh, I thought I would flag this issue because this is a hungry elephant and this is a bloated rat. <laughs> and this is what had happened in Durban because a lot of developed nations did not support the, <laughs> the basic countries because they felt that you know the, the dragon is already very bloated and with seven like megawatt and one of the highest per capita consumption of energy, it doesn't require to be uh, you know carbon financed. Uh, another thing is, uh, if you look at the comparison, India, the service sector is what constitutes the larger part of GDP and in China we find that uh, industry is a larger part of GDP and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, in fact services are less because uh, of power and they are less power and industry has been a larger because uh, uh, of power. Uh, again, you find that uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, in power consumption, the industrial sector in China consumes 75%, whereas in India, the industrial sector only consumes 40% of the power. And this has also to do with the tariff system, which is followed in the local ways. Yes. Uh, this is how the uh, tariffs look like. You know, if you look at the uh, particularly industrial tariff, in the industrial tariff, India, the industrial power tariff is very high. That is one reason which is holding back so much of development. And uh, if you look at uh, residential tariff, India residential tariff is less than China. And agriculture tariff in India is highly subsidized. That's why I was raising this question again and again. How do you collect uh, revenue from when you make supplies to agriculture? Because in India, large part of uh, power which is supplied to the uh, farmers, it is not metered. So, you know, they only pay on the load connected load and they don't pay on how much power is consumed. So they are one of the biggest guzzlers of power, but then that tariff is either very low or tariff is not very good. Okay. Uh, now coming to, you know, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the cash management, if you look at it, we find that this is how a typical uh, cash outgo of a power utility looks like. Power purchase consumes more than 72% of the uh, your, uh, utility cost and followed by that is wages and then you have interest charges and you have depreciation charges, administrative and business expenditure and generation charges which is again a part of power purchase cost. So if you look at it about more than 80% of the cost is either a power purchase cost or it is a cost incurred on the wire business. So utilities main expenditure either is on the power credit purchase or on the wire business. So this is where the cash flow management has to happen. On the area of wages, that is because very little scope for making any change. But these are the areas where really one can work and bring about cash management system. Okay. As far as uh, India is concerned, we had, uh, you know, we we have a system where a uh, lot of Electricity which is supplied does not get built or collected, and we have a high degree of ATNC losses. And today, the ATNC losses in, are in the region of almost 30 percent. And some of the provinces which I was showing, which are low consuming provinces, the losses are as high as 55 or 60 percent. And in our particular, you know, power utility which I earlier used to represent, the Delhi Power Corporation, uh, in night. In year 2002, we decided to kind of privatize that. It was a state utility. At that time, the losses were about were roughly 52%. And uh, what was suited the losses was technical loss, commercial loss, and the collection loss. Now, ATNC loss means you bill for a certain amount and you collect only a percentage of that. So what was happening is that if you are uh, you know, you are buying power, that is 100 unit, units you are buying, you are only collecting 40 units. So 60 units you are not collecting. So you can understand the state of the state of power utilities. Now when the privatization happened, you know, uh, many of these new power utilities, they started working on production of the ATNC losses. Because the disinvestment which we carried out in the uh, uh, province of Delhi, it was not based on how much value the middle would give. It was based on efficiency parameters. That is, in the next three to four years, how much ATNC losses is going to be That was 
uh, uh, methodology for us. So we have followed a business valuation model. Now this, uh, after uh, the distribution utilities they took over, they started working on reduction of commercial losses and also on the technical losses. Commercial losses basically consisted of theft, tampering, inaccurate meter reading, delay in meter recording, billing, unmetered supply to agriculture, and of course, when there are commercial losses, the technical losses naturally follow because you don't have money to invest in infrastructure. So you have transformers which are overloaded, you have uh, conductors which are poor quality, you have low voltage, and because of that, there are transmission losses. These are some of the you know, points which were addressed, tempering of meters, no meters, old defective meters, no reading, wrong billing, non-payment of bills, vertical pressure. That was replaced with accurate meter, metering and replacement of old uh, electromechanical meter with electronic meter. And also about 30-40% of supplies were unmetered and they were brought under the metering habit. Okay. Then there was uh, effective disconnection wherever payments were not being made, speedy trial, special codes were set up to redressal of uh, all this uh, commercial losses. Okay. Okay. Apart from that, the even billing cycle was reduced because earlier the billing cycle uh, used to take almost three months. And from that it was, what we did is that we reduced it to about two and a half months. And that uh, made quite a bit of difference because the generator used to charge uh, on a two monthly basis, whereas we were get, uh, coming, getting from the consumer two and a half monthly basis. So now it was, with making change in this, the cash flows were matched. That is power supply versus whatever collection was being made from the consumer, both have been tallied. Apart from that, what happened is that uh, is you know a lot of innovation on the working capital management side uh, was also taken up. One was you know uh, uh, as the ATNC losses reduced, the balance sheet of the distribution companies also started looking up. And once the balance sheet of distribution companies started looking up, they started uh, having access to uh, funds from the banks and other commercial sources. And what had happened is that. So far, the government used to come and step in and finance this kind of losses. Now, the government stepped back. And people who visit Delhi uh, last five, six years, you will find that huge investment is happening in city infrastructure. And that is because one reason for that is that whatever money was going into uh, subsidizing the losses of theft uh, in, uh, you know, in the uh, electricity sector, that money was now getting saved. And no financing was coming from the government. They had, the utilities had become self-sufficient. And the government's money was now going for other purposes, metro, road infrastructure, bridges, and so on. So, uh, uh, the alternative source of financing for short, shorter duration started. And uh, the power purchase, again, which, was, which is almost 70 to 75% of the total utility cost, that now started getting fully funded by the working capital. Apart from that, uh, these companies were also able to use commercial papers and bring down the cost of borrowing on the working capital. And uh, also, what had happened is that you know this sector had to become break even in three or four years period. And during that period, the gap between supply and collection had to be funded. And this was the real challenge because you know you can. Fund a time gap, but to fund a you know uh, a revenue gap, no banker would be ready. So that was the biggest challenge as to who would fund this revenue gap. So for that, you know, a power stabilization fund asset was created, a funding mechanism, and that funding mechanism was used to fund the you know, transition period. And uh, you know, with the reduction of ATNC losses. Later on, this entire debt will be serviced. So, it's a very good, you know, for countries like, well, uh, in fact, South Africa, Brazil, India, and many other countries, 
in West Asia, where you have this problem of heavy ATNC losses. This model is a uh, very useful model because this can really help in not using a budgetary support of the government and still bring about reduction in the losses and